All right, we're starting a new series today. It's called Adam's Family. Everybody say Adam's Family. Adam's Family. Yeah, that's the series we're starting today. And you know we are Zion Music got a theme song for you for this series. Y'all ready for it? We are Zion Music. Give it to them. They like that. That's We Are Zion Music. This is the Adams Family Series. If you have a Bible electronically or manually, turn with me to Genesis chapter 2. Yeah. And if whether you have the Bible or not, we got you covered. The verses will come on the screen. If you're physically able to stand with me to honor God's word without harm to yourself, please stand as I read this passage that I want to focus on today. I'm going to start reading at verse 7, and then I'm going to end the reading at verse... I'm going to read 7. I'm going to read verse 18. I'm going to read verse, verses 21 to 23. That's what I'm going to do. All right, beginning at verse 7, it says, Then the Lord God took some soil from the ground, and he made a man. He breathed air into the nose of the man to give him life, so the man became alive. Mm, verse 18, then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to live alone. I will make a helper who is right for him. Verse 20, so the Lord God caused the man to sleep, and while the man was sleeping, God took a rib from the man. I said this at every service. I got to say it to y'all too. So this is just a joke. It's just a joke. Look at somebody next to you and say, this is just a joke. Don't be, don't be, don't be called in the shade room and all that. It's just, just a joke. When I was in Bible college and I was studying Bible in the Old Testament survey class, I had questions about the ethnicity of Adam. I just wanted to know. I wanted to know what the Garden of Eden was, and this professor says it had to be in the region of Africa. And so then I said, well, then Adam had to be black. That's, uh, I mean, so, so one of my classmates, cool guy, his name was Shane. He was a pastor. He was a white guy, really cool. He didn't mean no harm by it. He leaned over and whispered to me in class one day. He said, you know, you know, Keith, Adam couldn't have been black. He could not have been black. I said, How you, what you mean? He says, you know God couldn't have got no rib from no black man like that. <laughs> Just wanted to wrap. Anyway, back to verse 21. So the Lord God caused the man to sleep. While the man was sleeping, God took a rib from the man. Then he closed up the place in his body and he covered it again. Verse 22, the Lord God used the man's rib to make a woman. He brought the woman to the man. Verse 23, then the man said, this is Adam. Finally, this is someone who's just right for me. She has bones that are taken from my bones. Her body comes from my body. I will call her woman because God used me, a man, to make her. Before you're seated, I want you to put in the chat and I want you to tell two people near you, tell them this, I was built for this. Yeah, I'm built for this. <laughs> I'm built for it. You may be seated. I'm built for this. I don't know of too many more things in life that are more difficult to deal with than to live life without knowing why you're here. Purpose. What is my purpose? Why did God make me the way he made me? Why did he give me the abilities and talents he gave me? Why am I so quirky? Why did he make me with the flaws and the strengths and the passions and the interests that I have? 
To live life without knowing my purpose is hard to describe how frustrating that is, especially when you're around people who seem like they always knew from the time they were kids. You ever know somebody like that? From the time they were kids, they knew what they were supposed to do. And it makes you just say, well, what about me? So you end up changing majors every semester. You, know, you can't wait to get to the admin, the, the registrar's office, and say, I'm not taking that anymore. I don't even like that. And, and you're going through this quest, and, and you're trying jobs, and you're trying career paths, and, and then you go into network marketing, and then you try this, and you try this field, and, 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 and you try these things having no idea, will I enjoy it, and can I even be successful at it? Is this even me? Does anybody understand what I'm talking about here? Like, that is a struggle. And then you have to deal with, on top of that, the pressure of parents who are well-meaning but fear-driven when they say, you need to get you a good education so you can get you a good job. And what they're talking about is safety, not purpose. I don't, am I at the right church today? I'm t- they're talking about, they, they, you remember back a few uh, decades ago, they said, make sure you study them computers. It was a, get into the computers and get you some computers. Everybody was studying computer science. We didn't know what that meant, but you got, you got to make sure you're studying them computers because they ain't going to have no jobs if you don't know them about computers. And so it is very, what it does is when you don't know what you've been built for, it messes with your self-image and your self-worth and your self-value, and it, it, it suppresses your confidence and makes you intimidated around people because people seem to be clear about what it is that they're supposed to be doing, and yet I don't know. But I got good news for you today. I got a word for you today. I'm going to turn some lights on for you that I learned from Adam's life of how you can know what you're built for. Because once you discover what your purpose is, it changes the game. It changes the whole trajectory of your life once you know why God made you the way he made you. And first of all, I want to start with that, that God made you uniquely from scratch. That's the first thing I want to tell you, that God made you uniquely from scratch. Like God didn't didn't just cookie cut you and and God didn't find you already made and he warmed you up and microwaved you. When you look at Adam, God made Adam from the soil, from the ground. In in, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, it says, this is what happened when God was making the earth, that the earth didn't have any vegetation on it. There were no plants, that there was nothing growing on the earth. God had not sent rain to the earth in verse 5 because he didn't have anybody to dig the ground so that the plants could grow. And then verse six says, but there was water coming up from under the earth that made all the top of the ground wet. And from that wet soil, verse seven says, and then he made Adam. He he made Adam, y'all, from from soil, wet soil. It was sort of like Play-Doh. I'm going to make a quick Adam for you right now and, and do it. By the time you open, close your eyes. Close your eyes for 10 seconds. And when you get up, I'm going to have Adam finished. Cause, cause, mm, mm, mm. It, well, Adam's leg just fell off this time. Though. See how we did that? that say, so so here's, the, here's the deal. Here's the deal, y'all. Like, Everything else Adam, everything else God made in chapter one, he didn't make it with his hands, he made it with his mouth. He made it with his voice. When God created the light, when God says, God said in chapter one, verse three, let there be light, and it happened. When God wanted to separate the firmaments, he says, let it be, and it happened. Everything God created in chapter one throughout the whole chapter, he did it by what is called a fiat. He spoke it into existence. He said it, and it was. And that's how he did everything. But when God was ready to create Adam, he didn't speak it. He reached into the soil and handcrafted Adam and made him perfectly, patiently into his own image. God molded Adam into his own image and made Adam, Adam, you will be a human form of who I am. You will be like me. You will be made in my image. So you'll have the power to do what I do. Like I spoke the world into existence. You can speak those things that are not. Oh yeah, this this is not that kind of church. You can speak those things that are not as though they are because you are like me. And when God made Adam, he never duplicated it. 
even if he had an Adam Jr., it's not the same person. <laughs> Let me tell you something about you. When God made you, he will never make another you again. There is never, there's never another person with your DNA, your fingerprint, your blueprint. You are fearfully and wonderfully made by God. And he didn't go in the soil to make you. He went in your mother's womb and all he worked with was a sperm cell and an egg. And he put you together from just that. How marvelous is our God that he can take something so simple and make something so complex. You have been made by God. God, there will never be another you. Stop trying to be like everybody else. You're the only you we will ever see. Let us meet you and let us discover who you are because somebody can get your name. They can be named after you, but they can't be you. Somebody can have your mannerisms, but they can't be you. Your daughter might have your forehead. Your son might have your nose. People might be able to look at your child. I can tell that's your child right there. That's my child, but that's not me, and I'm not them. There will never be a duplicate. You can have an identical twin. Y'all can dress the same the whole life that you live. You can wear the same hairstyle. You can get tattoos on the same part of your body, but you're still two separate people. God will never duplicate any human being. You have been designed uniquely by God. That's worthy of a praise that he made you special, and he didn't make a mistake. He knew exactly what he was doing when he made you. And watch this. Here's the connection to purpose. He made you not just on purpose, he made you for purpose. <laughs> Before Adam was born, his purpose was already established. The need he was supposed to meet when he was built in verse 7 already existed in verse 5. <laughs> Ad, watch this. Adam's assignment wasn't made for him. He was made for his assignment. If you ever want to know what your purpose is, figure out what needs attract you because you were built to satisfy a need. The problem always precedes the solution. So here's what God did. Before he made Adam in verse 7, in verse 5, he set up the problem. Here's the problem. I got a whole world, but I ain't got no vegetation. There are no plants growing in verse 5. There's no grass growing in Genesis 2-5 is where I am. Not only that, God is not sending rain. Somebody say, send rain. Send rain. He's not sending rain. It doesn't mean he doesn't have it. He's not sending it. <laughs> the reason why he's not sending it is at the end of the verse, because I don't have a body. I have no body. I've got land. I've got opportunity. I've got problems. I've got needs. I've got potential, but I don't have a person. And the person is going to dig the soil so the plants can grow. So I'm in an environment where there's no growth, where there's no rain, and there's no vegetation because there's no person. Oh, y'all missing it. Y'all missing it. So I'm bringing in the person to create the growth, to create the rain, to release the rain, and to solve the problem. You see what I'm saying? So, so watch this. So he has no vegetation. Verse 7, he creates Adam. Watch this. Out of the same soil he's called to fix and work in. Verse 8 says, after Adam is created, now God plants a whole garden. So he went from no vegetation to a whole garden. And guess where he put Adam? In the garden. Ooh, somebody say, God, plant me where I'm purposed. That's your problem. You're misplanted. Ooh, I don't know who I'm talking to here. I have been planted a whole lot of places, but ooh, thank you, Lord. This is coming to me right now. Do y'all know I used to work here? I used to work in this building. I was a cashier in this Kmart in 1993. I'm not even lying to you. I can show you where the break room is because that's where I spent most of my time. But I had no idea he was plant, oh God, he was planting me. I can't even preach it right. I can't even preach it right. I had no idea that there would be problems in this building that weren't paper or plastic, not cash or credit. There would be emotional problems and spiritual problems in this building before I even knew who I was. He was building me and preparing me and planting me in a place that I would come back to in, 19, in 2020. Let me go back to Adam. Y'all, I'm sorry. Y'all going to take it the wrong way. He plants him in this garden in verse 8. 
Then in verse 9, verse 9 says he talks about the garden has got trees in it. And the trees are not just beautiful to look at, they're fruitful. Ooh, it's so important to not just be cute. Be cute, be effective. Oh God, I'm preaching that. Be cute, be effective. Be cute, be fruitful. Be cute, be on your business. Be cute, handle your business. Don't just be cute, that ain't enough. In the middle of the garden, there were two special trees. One tree was gives life. We'll talk about that later. Another tree was giving knowledge of good and evil. Then, because he's got his man now, in verse 10, he can send water. So he starts sending these rivers. I'll talk about that another time. I want to drop down to the middle of verse 15. In the middle of verse 15, it says, the Lord God took the man that he put in the Garden of Eden and put him in the Garden of Eden because God wanted him to work in the garden and take care of it. Now, that was his purpose. The problem was there before he was born. So God planted him where he wanted him to be purposed to solve the problem. Are y'all following me? So Adam, I put you here because remember in verse 6, I don't have anybody to dig the soil so the plants can grow. So Adam, get your shovel uh, and start digging. Now, here's the key. Adam's job was to dig the soil. God was going to make it grow. Because you can't just dig. You need something else. You need rain. So God says, I've been holding up the rain because I ain't had my man. I've been holding up the rain till you showed up. So until you, watch this, you do what you do. I'm picturing for y'all 2024. This is a prophetic message. This is what it's going to look like for some of y'all in 2024. You're going to just be digging. All you're doing is digging. But it ain't by power. It ain't by might. It's by my spirit, says the Lord. I'm going to add to your work supernatural work because you can't make it rain but if anybody understands that you were built for something somebody lift up your hands say God let it rain on me open the floodgates of God of heaven and let it rain you do your part God will do his part because he can do what only he can do you just dig because it ain't gonna grow till you get there now watch this watch this you can stop the rain. It may look bad. It may look messy. But God's going to use you. That's because you're not there yet. Who, if you understand what I'm saying, I want you to tell two more people. Tell them, I'm built for this. Help me preach this real quick. I'm built for this. I'm built for this. I'm built for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell all your haters, don't hate me. I'm built for it. <laughs> All the naysayers, I'm built for it. All the distractions and the naysayers, I'm built for it. The stress, I'm built for it. The pressure, I'm built for it. The problems, I'm built for it. He wired me to fix this. He wired me to deal with this. The reason why I get upset when I see it is because he built me for it. The reason why I fix disorder and chaos is because I've been built to fix disorder and chaos. The reason why I look at children and don't like children not being educated is because he built me to educate children. They put me in administration, but I'm built for edu- y'all ain't ready for me today. Do what you're built to do. Do what you're built to do. If you do what you're built to do, God will take care of everything else. What needs are you drawn to? What burden do you have? That's your assignment. And it was there before you got here. You were built for it. Ooh, whoa. Go back to verse 7. Oh, hold it. Hold it. He's built for it before he's endowed for it. It is possible, Pastor Jason, to be formed but not filled. God put them together. He's framed and formed in the image of God. He is built for the assignment. And then God gives him what else he needs. (laughs) He blows in him. Because, check this out, that's not just oxygen. That's what the Hebrew calls Ruach Elohim. That's the spirit of God. Because even though you're built for it, you still need his spirit. The problem with some of y'all, with all due respect, you got talent, but you don't have grace. 
You got abilities, but you don't have anointing. You got privileges, but you don't have power. You got all the talent in the world, and every you got the resume, but you're not getting the results that you could have because you don't have the Ruach Elohim. But somebody that understands what I'm talking about say, God, breathe on me. Give me your power. Because some of y'all think that God only works in church. God can work in law firms. He can work in accounting firms. He can work in restaurants. He can work in hair salons. God can do anything. He is the great I am. And he can do whatever you are learning how to do. He can show you how to do it better. Breathe on me, God. Breathe on me. <laughs> Don't just build me, breathe on me. <laughs> Don't just frame me, feel me. <laughs> Don't, just, Don't just point me in the direction of my burden. Give me what I need, because in you I want to live and move and have my very being. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The problem is we limit God to church stuff when God is the ultimate professional. <laughs> if you're an electrician, he's the light of the world. If you're a mortician, he's the resurrection and the life. If you're a baker, he's the living bread. If you sell water, he's the living water. If you're a geologist, he's the rock of ages. If you're a florist, he's the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. If you're an astrologer and you're into zodiac signs, he's the, he's the day star and the bright and morning star. Where if you're a bicyclist, he's a wheel in the middle of a wheel. <laughs> Whatever you need, God can do. If you're lying, he's the truth. If you're dying, he's the life. If you're confused, he's the way. God can do anything. Who am I preaching to today? If you're a botanist, he's the true vine. I don't know who I'm talking about. There ain't nothing you can sign up for that God can't fix and show you how to do. Somebody say, give me your power. You good, but you'd be awesome if you wasn't just formed, but you were filled. He says, you ain't even, here it is, here it is. Adam was formed, then life came into him through the Ruach, the breath of God, Elohim. Watch this. He was just soil before that. You were just a compilation of a developed embryo of egg and sperm until you develop into a person and you just a person until you're born again. <laughs> and he birthed you with your assignment in mind. But when he rebirths you, he empowers you to do it. Let me keep going, let me keep going. So Adam's going on, he got his life, he got his job. Single man, doing his thing. Know what he's here for. Got a relationship with God. Got a purpose. Knows what he's supposed to be doing. And God says in verse 18, I don't like that. Mm. It's not good. We got one problem here. It's not good that he be alone. So this is what God does in verse 19. He goes back to the soil. He goes back to the source from which he made Adam. It makes sense. Adam came from the soil. Let me go back to the soil and create companionship for him. So he goes back to the soil and God starts making animals out of the soil. He brings each animal to Adam. Adam names all the animals, flying animals, running animals, crawling animals. He names all of them. But verse 20 says, but you know what? There was not a helper right for Adam. So God puts Adam to sleep. While Adam's, because God knows he needs a spouse. But God said it's not good that he should be alone, not Adam. Adam didn't say, Lord, you know, I'm kind, you know I'll be seeing the giraffes and stuff together, man. But you, I'm kind of, I'll be kind of feeling like, you know, you know what I'm saying? I want, you know, I want, you know, God come. No, God says, it's time. Be careful that your desire to be married is not coming from somewhere other than God. Because if, if your auntie keeps asking you and your mama keep asking you and your friends keep asking you, that's going to put social, so, that's going to put a, a, a climate of pressure on you that may make you get into something that you may not want to be in. Because there's some benefits to being by yourself. 
So God put him to sleep. I'm going to leave y'all alone. God put him to sleep. Am I going too slow? God put him to sleep. And while he was asleep, God takes his ribs. Takes a rib. So he, in order to get the rib, God had to open them up. So he's got to create an incision. Mm. Go in, almost like a C-section, to pull the life of his wife out of him. Then close him back up before he wakes up and build his wife. Mm. Built his wife for him while he was asleep. Now, this is very interesting because before I talk more about this, first of all, Eve was created differently than everybody else. So when God created the world, he spoke it. When he created Adam, he went to the soil. When he created the animals, he went to the soil. When he created Eve, he didn't speak it. He didn't go to the soil. He went inside of Adam. So Eve doesn't have an earthly origin from the ground or an ethereal origin from the spoken word into the atmosphere. She has a relational origin. She comes out of a person. People, I don't know why people don't see that. People get mad at me all the time when I say women are just ahead of us relationally. If you watch, if you watch little kids, if you watch a little girl, typically, typically a little girl is more domestic in the way she plays. She's more caring and nurturing towards her toys. She plays like family games and that stuff. And little boys, when they eight, nine, still blowing stuff up. <laughs> they think girls are yucky. And I'm not saying we can't catch up. I'm just saying we came from the dirt, man. That's who we, we from them streets. We don't even know about all that little stuff. Y'all didn't come out the dirt or the streets. Y'all came out of us. That's why you're sensitive when us not good. So let me go back to Adam for a second. So, so when Adam wakes up, not only... Does he see what God provided him, but he has to feel what, what it cost him to get it? Here's a, write this down. It costs you to be married. It costs to be married. And I ain't just talking about with the cost of the wedding, because now y'all don't even get married around here. Y'all go to Mexico and stuff to get married. You got to pay for them flights. It costs to get a caterer. It costs to get, to get a flower person. It costs to get the, the photographer and the videographer and the tux and, and the gown and, 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 and all that stuff. It, that stuff costs. And you can have a $50,000 wedding and a $5 marriage if you ain't careful. But that's not even the cost I'm talking about. I'm not even talking about what you had to pay to get married. I'm talking about what you had to give up to be married. When Adam got up from that sleep, don't just think he's just saying, look at what God did. He gave me a life partner. He gave me a lover. He gave me a companion. But he also, because he had had that rib all his life, he's got to be in pain. There's got to be some discomfort. And he's got to feel something. I'm missing something. I'm missing something I've always had. <laughs> And I can't ask for it back because I had to give this up to get what I got. The, Adam's dowry for marriage was his own flesh and blood. I got it. And if I ever ask for give me my rib back, then, then it's over. I want to ask every single person a question in here. What is it going to cost you to get married and then to stay married? What you going to have to give up? Yeah, what you gonna have to give up? What is it gonna cost? What are you gonna have to give up? You might have to give up your independence. You might have to give up your own isolated bank account that nobody can know what you got. You might have to give up. See, it's hard to move from a me thinking to a we thinking because you've been me thinking a long time. Well, you have to give up being a mama's boy. Don't, don't, don't trip. I ain't trying to speak down to my, I know I was a mama's boy. You got to understand that. See, how do I know that? Verse 24. I ain't going to talk about that today. Verse 24. Adam, also in order for this marriage to work, you got to leave. Y'all don't even read the Bible. You're going to have to leave your mother and your father to become one with her because your wife should not be in competition with your mother. I said your mother, M-U-V-A. 
Now she's sitting in the car and now she got to get in the back, by, not by her choice to defer to your mother, but because you put your mother before your wife. But you were supposed to leave your mother because that's the woman that raised you, but the woman that's going to raise your children is, oh, y'all ain't ready for me today. I can see this. Y'all getting uncomfortable right now. What you going to give up? Because you ain't married to your mama, you're married to your wife. And now your wife feels some kind of way about your mama. Ooh, 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 ooh. ooh, yeah, they ain't coming back for part two. I can tell you this right now. They like, man, they, he was done all right till he went all over the net. Man, what time is it, man? Man, what time is it? What you gonna give up? You gonna give up your passwords to your phone? Are you going to give up the friendships that you have that your spouse is uncomfortable with because you're friends with people who are single and cheaters and now you still want to be cool with them because you grew up with them. But now you got to grow up to another level because you're married now. And that, oh, y'all ain't ready for this conversation today. What are you willing to give up to get married and to stay married? It costs you to be married. It costs you to be married. But here's how you know some guys, I don't know who, man, I don't know who my Eve is. I don't know who, who my Eve is. Here's how you can know who your Eve is. And here's Eve, here's how you can know who you're an Eve for. Here's how you can know who your Adam is. You've got what they're missing. Because when Adam woke up, everything he was missing was standing in front of him. It could have been a thousand women in that garden. Only one of them had his rib. Ooh, y'all gonna miss that. Y'all gonna miss that. Look for your rib. Look for what's missing. You know when somebody says opposites attract? That's true. That's because that person has what you're missing. Opposites attract. As you get older, opposites annoy. <laughs> I'm gonna tell the whole truth today since we out there. Ain't nobody here but us. You know, that stuff that used to be cute ain't cute no more. The older we get, the more relationally prejudiced we are. We don't want to be around people that's different. We want to be around people that like what we like. <laughs> you think what we use, we like the same stuff funny. We like the same movies, like the same restaurants, like the same activities. We don't want to deal with nothing different. That's why we try to change people. But you can know who you're supposed to be with because you got... But they're missing. Let me talk about Eve. Let me talk about Eve. And then we don't. Because she's in Adam's family too. Eve was built for her purpose too. Before Eve was built by a rib. With a rib. She was built to fix a problem. What was the problem? Verse 19, Adam. Verse 18, Adam's alone. Verse 20, he doesn't have the right help. What's the solution? Eve. You're the solution to his loneliness and you're the help he needs. Every Eve listen to me say, I'm built for this. I'm built for this. So, so operate like you're built. If God gave you an Adam, you're built to help him and you're built to make up the difference and, and meet the need that he was lacking. So, 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 so why a rib? Why would God use a rib? Out of all the things that God would use, he decided to use a, a rib. First of all, if you're an Eve, you're built covered. You're built to be covered. Notice where the ribs are in the body. The ribs are under the skin. They didn't have clothes on them, but even naked, the ribs are not exposed. They're covered. And every rib is built to be covered. I don't care how successful you are, how high you climb up in the corporate ladder, you are innately built as a woman to be covered. There is something about you, you may not have found a covering, but there is something about you that wants to be covered. There's some security. <laughs> There's something about you that wants somebody that you can trust that's got you covered. <laughs> this got you covered. That somebody that if you get caught eating forbidden fruit together won't out you. Yeah. Yeah. See, y'all don't read the Bible. 
So, so, so when they got caught, <laughs> Adam's like, hey, when, when they was naked, he first saw him. He's like, whoa, man, that's what I'm talking about. When they got caught, he said, that wasn't even me. That was that woman you gave me. I bet they talked about that later on that night. He didn't say, he could have stepped up and said, God, you know, it wasn't holy, holy God. It wasn't even about her because I should have stepped up when the snake was talking to her. I, you left me in charge. You spoke directly to me. I should have stepped in and interrupted that conversation. He didn't do none of that. He said, no, nah, that's not covered. It was her. Covered. Any woman that's been built by God wants to be covered. She wants to know if something happens to her husband, are we covered? If something happens to the children, are we covered? If something happens to the car, are we covered? Do you, do you ever notice that in a wedding, nobody asks in a wedding, who gives this man to be married? Nobody does that. Every, every marital book says, who gives this woman to be married? Because everybody understands that she's supposed to be Somebody over her has evaluated this person to see if he is worthy to take over coverage. So I ain't about to drop my last name off of you and put his name on you without you first asking me, do you give this one? Y'all ain't ready for me today. That's covering. You were built to be covered. Are you right working with me? I'm going to say one more thing and I'm done. About these ribs. <laughs> Rib. The rib cage, anatomically, is an amazing apparatus because it holds up more than you know. The rib, the shoulder muscles, the chest, the upper abdomen, and the back is being held up by the rib cage. If you deconstruct or remove the rib cage, a person's entire torso will collapse. Ribs are built to support. If you're an Eve, you're built to support. You're built to hold your man up. You are Adam's greatest supporter. And what makes a man disappointed and hurt is when he lives with an Eve who doesn't support him. Ooh, all the clapping, all the standing up, all of you, that's my past up there. Oh, that's over. That's... So I lost 75% of the whole check. <laughs> y'all still with me at Landover? I know y'all with me at Fort Washington. They just unconditional. <laughs> You're built to support. And a man can tell how supportive you are. He pays attention to where the support is going. It's going to the kids and your girlfriends. And your mama, they get, you ripping and running for them. You go out of your way to support them. Some of them get sick. You give them soup and, and give them juice and, and tuck them in and all that. Your husband gets sick. You say, you need to slow down. <laughs> well, he's doing all that ripping and running to make provision for you and them kids. <laughs> There's some men in here that... They one second from jumping up and saying amen. They ain't never say amen in church their whole life. They too much of a thug to say amen. But something in them right now saying, man, boy, man, you my pastor for real. I, I'm, where you join this place? <laughs> where do you join? <laughs> it's something, I feel you, bro. I know you want to say, you don't know what to say amen. Well, what's up? You, you don't know what to say. Ooh, ooh, you don't know what to say, man. It's just like, but I, I, man, I felt that. It was Dr. E.V. Hill was the first person I heard do this analogy. He, he compared marriage to a boxing match. And he says, when two fighters go into a ring to fight each other, for three minutes, they're literally trying to destroy each other. Punches and body punches, sometimes low blows, sometimes elbows. They're grabbing each other and swinging on each other. And for three minutes, it's brutal. And if you're getting beat, you can't wait for them three minutes to be over. And at the end of three minutes, the bell rings and you go to your corner and you got 60 seconds to get some love. 
in your corner, there's a cut man, there's a trainer, there's a manager, and they're saying, you can do this. And somebody's rubbing your shoulders, somebody pouring water on you. They give you something to drink. They ministering to your cuts. They're telling you the champ. You ain't won nothing. You the champ, though. You the champ. <laughs> Keep your hands up. Stick and move. The quality of what happens in the corner impacts the performance in the fight. And for 60 seconds, you get enough love and encouragement to go back out there and fight again. And I want to tell every Eve listening to me, your Adam is in a fight. He's in a fight against injustice. He's in a fight of being undervalued and mistreated. He's in a fight against temptation. And no, he's not a perfect fighter, but he's fighting. He's in a fight to make, to make you proud of him. And for three minutes, if you were, every single day of his life, he's fighting. And he's hoping when the, when the day ends, he can go home to a corner where there's some love and some water waiting and some support and saying, thank you for fighting for us. Thank you for what you do for us. And he's not ignored to come home to a corner where there's no communication. Load a bar. Or even worse, he has to come home to a corner and fight. You ain't nothing. When he has a corner that's not supportive, they call it in boxing a neutral corner. He prefer going to a neutral. I'd rather come over here to a neutral corner. Well, I don't hear nothing. Just go over here to happy hour and get drunk enough to go to a corner I don't want to go to. Y'all ain't going to talk to me today. You're going to act, act like you knew. Or he might go to a corner not where Eve is, but where old naive is. And she will tell him everything you want. And I know you don't like this because you say, well, don't I deserve support too? Everybody in the marriage should be supported, but we're talking about Eve now. You know how quick we are to say, but what about them? You can't never listen to stuff about you because that's what men do all the time. All they do is bash men. Or women saying, why don't he talk about him? Just listen to your part. We're talking about Eve now. And though there should be mutual support in the marriage, you have been built to support. You've been built to hold him up. Don't let him down. I'm going to stop right there. Let's pray. Every one of us has been built by God with a purpose. Embrace it and work it. Can't nobody do it like you. Is that a song? I don't know. It just sounds like a song. Can't nobody do what you want because there will never be another you. You're the only you. Do it. Do it and don't just do it in your power. That's the problem. Do it with the power that God gives you. It'll make a difference. God, if you planted me here, make me productive here. Stop, stop being envious of other gardens. Mm. Ooh. Produce where he planted you. Father, thank you so much for how you've designed us. Thank you that we've been fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, I pray that whatever you want us to do, whatever need we're supposed to meet, whatever problem we're supposed to solve, may we do it not without you, but with you, because we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.